Good morning, church. Um, Today, our sermon passage is in the book of Romans. We'll be in Romans 6, verses 3 through 6. If you could turn there, it's in the New Testament, uh, right in between Acts and 1 Corinthians. All right, Romans 6, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his— We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Well, thank you, Mariah. Well, this morning, um, we are continuing, as I mentioned um, in our call to worship and welcome this morning, uh, our sermon series we began last week um, on the church. And so I mentioned this last week, this is different from what we normally do. We normally just preach uh, through books of the Bible. Uh, But at the beginning of this year, uh, really from uh, first Sunday last week until uh, Sunday before Easter, um, we're preaching more of a, a topical series on uh, the church. And so many of you um, have probably heard the name um, Charles Spurgeon. Um, he was a 19th century uh, preacher in England, and he once referred to the church as this. He referred to the church as the dearest place on earth. Like, just, just think about that. Like, where, where's your favorite place on earth? Like, think about that. Like, had that image in your mind. Where's the, where's the dearest place on earth to you? Your special favorite place that fuels you and gives you life and fuels your affections. Where, 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 where is that? So for, for some of you, I know you, it's the mountains, right? For, for others of you, it's the beach. Like for others of you, it's maybe a certain coffee shop or certain park or a certain city, major city, or a certain country overseas, or for some of you, it might be like Arrowhead Stadium, or I like show of hands real quick, don't be shy, I know who you are, if you were at the game last night, <laughs> that's awesome, so... 25 years ago, I would have been there, but um, not anymore. All right, these are all special places, and I'm not, I'm not here to like downplay or minimize any of these places. I kind of have my special place as well. But for Spurgeon, the dearest place on earth was right here, the, the church. And, and here's why. He, he goes on to write, It's because, he says, nothing in the world, the reason that the dearest place on earth is the church, he says, is because nothing in the entire world is dearer to God's heart than his church. And like, that's true. That's true. Like, think about it, right? Think about just how precious and valuable and dear the church is to God. Think about that. The the church is Christ's bride. The church is God's temple that God dwells in by His Spirit. The church is Christ's family, or Christ's body. The church is God's family. The church is a holy nation, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a people for God's own possession. The church is God's inheritance. The church is the pillar and buttress of the truth. Like Jesus spilled his own blood. Jesus died in order to purchase and obtain the church. The Bible says that the glory of God is displayed through the church. 
The Bible says in Ephesians 3 that the wisdom of God is displayed through the church. Right, so, get practical. Like, wrap your mind around that. What that means is that every time that we gather together as a church on Sunday morning, that this is what we're walking into. Like, this is what we're walking into. This is who we're gathering together with. We're walking into God's temple. Like, not this building. It's not God's temple. We're God's temple. Every time, think about the Old Testament temple, right? Every time we're walking into church on Sunday morning to gather together with God's people, we're walking into God's temple. We're gathering together with Christ's bride. We're gathering together with Jesus' body. We're gathering together with God's family, God's chosen people. We're gathering together and walking into God's inheritance. We're walking into and gathering together with the royal priesthood. We're walking into and gathering together with a holy nation. In other words, we're walking into and gathering together with the dearest place on earth. And the reason it's the dearest place on earth is because there's nothing Nothing more precious, more valuable, and more dear to God's heart than his church. And since that's true, it's really, really important that we get church right. That we're not sloppy with how we do church and how we define things and how we do things like baptism and the Lord's Supper and membership and discipline and evangelism and discipling and that we're not sloppy in those things. We're not loose with those things. We don't just do what we think will work and we're overly pragmatic in those things. Instead of the church, it is all of these things. If the church is the dearest place on earth, the most precious, valuable, dearest thing to the Lord, it's really, really important that we get church right. And that we come to this word and let this word to define for us what the church is, who the church is, what a church does, how a church does those things, how a church is structured and organized, how a church is led, how a church is governed, what the essential elements and characteristics and traits of a biblical healthy church are. And that's what we're trying to do in this series. And so then... If you were here with us last week, you know we began this series with, with the most basic of all questions when it comes to this whole idea of the church. And that question was the question of who is the church? In other words, who, who does the church consist of? Who, who makes up the church? And if you remember, we, we answered that question by looking at the Old Testament book of Jeremiah chapter 31, in which God promised to make a new covenant and, and establish this new covenant people, this new covenant community. And in Jeremiah 31, what we saw is that the church is God's new covenant community. And we saw that this new covenant community consists exclusively and solely of regenerate, believing Christians who've been saved and fully forgiven by Jesus, by faith. This morning then, in week two of this sermon series, we're going to be looking at now what the Bible is going to describe as the identifying mark or the identifying sign of this new covenant community, the church. And the identifying mark or the identifying sign of this new covenant community, the covenant sign of this new covenant community, is baptism. Now I know when some of you hear that, like I know, you're like, okay, a sermon on baptism, great. I get that. Like most of us in this room, I think, are very familiar with baptism. Like, baptism is something we're familiar with. Baptism is something we're used to. We've read about baptism. We studied baptism in the Bible. We saw baptism last week. Many of you have been baptized, so you're very familiar with baptism. But just think about this for a minute. Like, let's be honest. If we were all honest, like, baptism's kind of weird, isn't it? Like, imagine you don't know anything about baptism, right? Nothing, you don't know anything about baptism. And then you just show up last week, without having any frame of reference or idea of baptism, and you see these two people in this baptistry, the, you think it's cold outside, that water in the baptism was 100 times colder than 
outside. Um, and, and I'm dunking Lauren into the water and lifting her back up. And you don't know anything about baptism and you see that. You're like, what were they doing? <laughs> like, what? I was just coming to church and some guy's taking somebody else and dunking them in water and bringing them. Like, what's that all about? Like, that's weird, right? Like, that's really, really, really weird. I know we're accustomed to it, but it's weird. Like, why? So then why do we do that? Like, why, once somebody professes their faith in Christ, are we like, where's the water? And we dunk them in there and we bring them back up real quick. Why, why, why do we do that? <laughs> that's odd. Well, that's a great question. And that's one of the questions we're going to be answering during this sermon series, or this sermon this morning. In this sermon, we're going to answer three questions. The first question is the question I just asked, like, why baptism? Why do we dunk people into water and bring them back up after they profess faith in Christ? Like, why do we do that? Why baptism? Second question is, is who is to be baptized then? And the third question then is, is how, should, how should a person be baptized? So why baptism, who is to be baptized, and how should a person be baptized? And at the, at, after we answer those questions, then we're going to talk about just this in your handout, but just three, three takeaways. Like what do we do in response to this? How do we respond to the answers to these questions regarding baptism? So let's start with question number one. Why Baptism. Why do we plunge, dunk somebody into water after they profess faith in Christ and become a Christian? Well, in order to understand the answer to that question, we have to first understand how baptism fits within the overarching storyline and story of the Bible. Because if we don't understand how baptism fits within the grand narrative of Scripture, then we won't understand the ultimate meaning of baptism and why we baptize people by plunging them into water and lifting them back up. And so then here's how baptism, this is an oversimplified explanation, but this is how baptism fits within the overarching story and grand narrative of the Bible, is that when we look at the Bible and the story of the Bible, what we see is that throughout the biblical story, there's this continual pattern, this continual pattern or theme of God saving his people by bringing them safely through the waters of judgment. In other words, as you go throughout Scripture, we see that water is a symbol and a means all throughout Scripture of God's judgment against sin. And over and over again, we see this pattern of God rescuing His people and saving His people through the waters of judgment. And so then think about this. I'll give you some examples. Think about this. Think about the beginning of the Bible and the book of Genesis. In the very beginning of the Bible, God creates the world and soon after he creates the world, then man rebels against his creator, man sins, man falls, mankind and the entire world then spins out of control, deeper and deeper into depravity, deeper and deeper into sin and wickedness. As a result then, how does God respond? God responds then by judging the world, by sending a worldwide flood. But as the flood waters of God's judgment come, God saves one man and his family, Noah. And they pass safely through the waters of God's judgment in the ark onto dry land or onto the new creation or the recreation. And after they pass through the waters, then what does God do? He makes a covenant with them. Example number two. We see the same pattern then with Israel, right? The people of Israel in the book of Exodus. If you remember, in the book of Exodus, God rescues the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. But as he saves them out of slavery in Egypt, if you remember, the Egyptians chase after them. And if you remember, the people of Israel then are trapped. On one side of them, they have the Egyptians that are chasing after them, wanting to kill them. And on the other side of them, the people of Israel have a body of water, <laughs> the Red Sea. And so they're trapped they have no place to go. So then what do they do? Well, in that moment, God, if you remember, miraculously and supernaturally opens up the waters so that the people of Israel can safely pass through the waters. But after they pass through the waters, the Egyptians, if you remember, go chasing after them and God relents and God lets his waters of judgment swallow them up and he drowns and kills all the Egyptians. And so again, don't miss it. What's going on here? The same thing that happened to Noah happened to the people of Israel here in Exodus. 
Once again, you have God's chosen people being saved. How? By passing through the waters of God's judgment to a new creation for the people of Israel, which was the promised land, the land that they had been promised. And do you remember what God did with Israel after he, they passed through the waters? He did this very same exact thing that he did with Noah. He made a covenant with them. So the example of Noah and the example of Israel then are ultimately meant to point us to Jesus. And the reason we know that is because when we get to Mark chapter 10, when Jesus speaks about his death on the cross, he says that on the cross he's going to drink the cup of God's wrath and be baptized. When he uses the word bab baptized or baptism there, he doesn't mean that he's going to be plunged into water on the cross. Instead, he means that he's going to be plunged into the waters of God's wrath when he drinks the cup of God's wrath, and, and he's going to be plunged into God's waters of judgment on the cross. It's in this way, then, when Jesus dies on the cross, that the same waters of God's judgment that were poured out on the world in Noah's day, and the same waters of God's judgment that were poured out on the Egyptian army in the Exodus, the same waters of God's judgment were poured out on Jesus on the cross. He was baptized. He was plunged into. He was dunked. He was immersed into the flood waters of God's judgment on the cross. But guess what? Just like Noah and just like Israel, Jesus passed safely through the waters of judgment when he was raised back to life and when his body was resurrected. And his resurrection then served as the first fruits of the new creation that was to come. And his, and his death and his resurrection then ushered in a new covenant with all those who would place their faith and trust in him. I, so then this right here is why we dunk people into water and bring them back up after they profess their faith in Christ. We, we do that because when we place our faith in Jesus, then we're united with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. Meaning when Jesus was plunged into the waters of God's judgment on the cross, our old man, meaning who we were before our conversion, who we were before faith in Christ, our old man was plunged with him and died. And when Jesus passed through the waters of God's judgment in his resurrection, then we safely passed through with him as we were spiritually raised back to life and born again and became a new creation and a member of the new covenant. And so then this right here is what baptism is a visible picture of. That baptism is a picture of how we as believers have safely passed through the waters of God's judgment in Christ. That when we lower somebody into the water, it's a picture of them being plunged into the waters of judgment with Jesus in his death and their old man, their old self, who they were before their conversion, dying with him. And when a believer is raised up out of the water, it's a picture of how they safely pass through the waters of God's judgment with Christ, and they were raised to a new life and became a new creation in Him. Just like Noah, just like Israel, and just like Jesus, and we've been united with Jesus. And so what's true of Jesus is now what's true of us. And that's what baptism and going down in the water and safely passing through the water and coming up is all meant to ultimately visually portray. And we see these truths in a number of places all throughout Scripture. I'm going to have these on the screen behind me real quick, and I'm going to read through these real quick. And as I read through these four different passages of Scripture, I want you to just see these common themes that appear in all of these passages that, that speak about this picture of, of baptism as a picture of safely passing through the waters of, God, waters of God's judgment as we've been united in Christ in His death and His resurrection. First passage is the one Moriah just read in, in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 6. Paul here writes about how baptism is a visible picture of our union with Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. So look at verse 3, Romans 6. Paul asks, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into, into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And then verse 5, 
he says, for if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Paul repeats that same exact theme a few books later in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. In Colossians 2, 12, Paul says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. A few books later then, we get to 1 Peter chapter 3. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter is going to connect our baptism with Noah being safely brought through the waters and through the flood waters of God's judgment. So 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 20, Peter writes, When God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, here it comes, were brought safely through water, the waters of God's judgment, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirty, of, of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then the final one is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Paul here is speaking about Israel passing through the Red Sea, and he speaks about Israel passing through the Red Sea. He refers to that as a baptism. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, "'For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers,' that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, the waters of God's judgment, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So there's a whole lot more that can be said about all four of those passages that we don't have time to get into. But what what I want you to see here is that that baptism isn't just some random thing that all of a sudden popped out of nowhere. Ah! I think we'll dump people into water and, and, and lift them back up. Instead of baptism... It's the, it's the ongoing pattern of Scripture. It fits the ongoing pattern of Scripture of God saving His people by bringing them safely through the waters of, of God's judgment. That's what He did with Noah. That's what He did with the people of Israel in the Exodus. That's what He did with Jesus in His death and His resurrection. And since we're united with Jesus by faith, then that's what our baptism symbolizes. That's what, that's what happens to us. And that's what's visibly portrayed when we're baptized as well. So that's the meaning of baptism and why we dunk people into water and how it fits within the overarching storyline of Scripture, which then leads to question number two. Who should be baptized then? If this is the meaning of baptism and what baptism signifies, then who should be baptized? And as many of you know, like that question is a hotly, hotly debated question that's been hotly debated for centuries now. Like there, there are some who would believe that baptism is solely for believers, meaning, meaning you should only baptize those who are true, genuine believers, who, who are, who've been converted, who've been born again. And so this is known as believer's baptism. This is what we practice and believe in as a church. Others, though, practice infant baptism, meaning they baptize infants, they baptize babies, they baptize those who, who obviously haven't placed their faith in Jesus and obviously aren't believers. And so the obvious question then is, okay, which one is, which one is right? Well, for answering that question, giving my understanding of what the Bible teaches and our church's understanding of what the Bible teaches when it comes to that question, let me say this, preface everything I'm about to say with this. This isn't a salvation issue. This isn't an issue of salvation. Like I know I've got many... Christian friends, many pastor friends who would believe in a different form of baptism than I believe. And and I count them as brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ. I dearly love them. We will live together in the eternal kingdom and the new creation to come. And so this isn't a salvation issue. At the same time, it's an important issue. It's a very important issue. And so then when it comes to this question, this debate, about infant baptism, who's to be baptized? Infant baptism versus believer's baptism. Here's the number one most important thing for you to realize and for you to know. It's this. This debate of infant baptism versus believer's baptism isn't ultimately a debate about baptism. 
It's a debate over the question, who is the church? Everybody with me? It's not a debate about baptism, ultimately. It's ultimately a debate about who is the church? Who is the church? In other words, your answer to the question of who is the church will determine whether or not you think only believers should be baptized or whether you think infants should be baptized as well. And, and here's why. Here are the arguments for those who hold to infant baptism. And let me say this, if, if that's somebody that's here this morning, this is going to be a, give me grace. Like this is an oversimplified argument, okay? And because of time, but this is the best I can do, okay? But those who hold to infant baptism would say this. They would argue, they would, they would, not, they would disagree with my sermon from last week on who is the church. They would disagree with that. They wouldn't agree that the church is exclusively made up of regenerate believing Christians like I, like I preached on last week. They, they would disagree with that. Instead, they would say that the new covenant community, the church, is a mixed community just like the old covenant community of Israel. And so we talked about this last week, right? If you remember, we talked about how the old covenant community of Israel was a mixed community, meaning it consisted of believers and unbelievers. And the reason that it was a mixed community is because the way that you became a part of the old covenant community of Israel was by physical birth, meaning you were physically born into it. And since you were physically born into it, then the old covenant community of Israel was a mixed community. It consisted of believing Jews and unbelieving Jews. And the covenant sign then that you were a member of this old covenant community was circumcision. And so circumcision was the sign that you were a member of the old covenant community of Israel. And so then on the eighth day after you were born, all Jewish boys were circumcised, signifying their membership and their entrance into the old covenant community of Israel. And so then, those who then hold to infant baptism believe that the nature and the structure of the Old Covenant community carries over into and continues into the New Covenant community. That the New Covenant community is a mixed community as well that you are physically born into. It consists of Jew and Gentile believers and their children. The main difference, though, is that the sign of the new covenant has changed. The sign of the new covenant isn't circumcision anymore like it was in the old covenant. The sign of the new covenant now is baptism. And because of that then, infants of believing parents are baptized, signifying their membership and entrance into the new covenant community, the church. Now, it's important to catch this. That doesn't mean then that, those, that these infants and children are saved and regenerated. It just means that they're members of the new covenant community, just like infants and unbelieving children who are members of the old covenant community, being able to enjoy the, the privileges and the blessings that come with being a part of that community, like hearing God's word, being a part of the fellowship of God's people, and things like that. Again, that's an overly simplistic explanation um, of, the, of the argument for infant baptism, but that's the main essence of the, the argument. So then, what then is the argument for believer's baptism, like we practice as a church? How would we respond to the arguments of infant baptism? Well, the arguments for believer's baptism, we would first of all say that, and you see this on your handout, that the new covenant community of the church is not, is not a mixed community of believers and unbelievers. Instead, the church consists exclusively of believers. And so then this was a whole sermon, right? If you were here last week from Jeremiah chapter 31. So if you have any questions regarding that statement, listen, that, listen to the sermon from last week from Jeremiah chapter 31. But the reason the church consists exclusively of believers, is because we believe that the way that you enter into and become a member of the new covenant community isn't by physical birth, like in the old covenant community, but it's by spiritual birth, by being spiritually reborn in Jesus. And the sign then 
that signifies that you've been spiritually born into the new covenant community and you become a member of the new covenant community isn't circumcision like in the Old Testament. Instead, it's baptism. That baptism is the covenant sign that you've entered into and belong to the new covenant community of God. And so do you see what both groups then have in common? Do you see what both groups have in common? Both groups, those who practice infant baptism, those who practice believer's baptism, both believe that baptism is the covenant sign that someone has entered into and belonged to the new covenant community. The question is, who is the new covenant community? That's the main difference. Those who practice infant baptism say the new covenant community is a mixed community of believing parents and their infants unbelieving and their unbelieving children. That's why they practice infant baptism, baptize infants. While we who practice believer's baptism would say the new covenant community is a regenerate community consisting only of believers. You're not physically born into it. You're spiritually born into it. So that's why we only baptize Christians who've been spiritually born again. Which is also why we require believer's baptism by immersion as a requirement for membership in our church. Like at times, this is a good question, but at times we get the question a lot, like why is baptism a requirement for membership at Cross Fellowship Church? Why, why is that? And that's, that's a great question. It's a really good question. The answer is pretty simple, though. And the answer is because we're a new covenant community. We're, we're the new covenant community. And the sign of the new covenant community is, is baptism. Like, that's, that's the answer. That, that just like the sign of membership and entrance into a membership in the old covenant community was circumcision, so the sign of entrance into a membership in the new covenant community is baptism. And just like it would have been unheard of and, and just completely unthinkable for a member of the old covenant community not to have the covenant sign of circumcision, so biblically speaking, it would, have been complete, it's com it would have been completely unheard of and unthinkable for a member of the new covenant community not to have the covenant sign of baptism. And not only that, but just like it would have been unthinkable and unheard of for a member of the old covenant community not to have gone through, safely gone through the waters of God's judgment, so it would have been completely unheard of, and think, unheard of and unthinkable, biblically speaking, for a member of the New Covenant community not to have gone safely through the waters of God's judgment in baptism. Like This is why in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, Paul says, he writes these words. He says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all. Like, why does he say that? Because these are the things, the essential elements that the body of Christians, the church, believe in and what unites them together. We all have the same Lord. We all have the same faith in Jesus. We all worship the same God and Father. And we've all been baptized one Lord, one faith, one God of all, one baptism. And so then I can't necessarily, I think I could, but I can't necessarily point you to a chapter and a verse that says baptism is a requirement for membership in a church. And the reason I can't is because it was just a given. It, it was just a given. If someone repented of their sin, placed their faith in Jesus, became a part of the new covenant community, they were given the sign of, of the covenant. They were baptized and became a part of the church. They were marked with the sign of the covenant. They pretty quick after that passed through the waters of baptism. And so biblically speaking, I know practically and functionally this isn't true 
in terms of how this practically fleshes itself out. But biblically speaking, in the Bible, the Bible knows nothing of the category of an unbaptized Christian because that person didn't exist in the Bible. And so then these aren't all the reasons, but these are some of the reasons why believers' baptism by immersion is a requirement for membership in our church. And that's who we believe, biblically speaking, is to be baptized. Which then leads to question number three. And question number three is this. How should you be baptized? If that's why should be baptized, who should be baptized, and third and finally, how should you be baptized? Again, this is a question that's hotly debated throughout the history of the church. Some churches sprinkle. Kind of wish we would have done that last week, but um, I almost changed my theology of baptism. No. Um, some churches pour, right? Like pour over your head. Um, we dunk people into water and bring them back up out of the water. So what's the right mode of baptism? And does it really even matter? Like, are we just arguing about semantics and how much water? You just want to use this water? You want to use all this water? Like, is that what this debate? But no, it's, this is really important. And so we as a church believe that the biblical mode for baptism is immersion. Submerging somebody into water and bringing them up out of the water as opposed to sprinkling or, or pouring. And there's three reasons why, and I'm going to hit these really, really quick for the sake of time. The first reason is because the Greek word baptizo, which is translated in English as, as baptize, means to submerge, dip, plunge, um, immerse. And so, in, in other words, this is just what the word baptize means. It, it means emerge, plunge. Something or someone, someone. It's just what the word means. So one of the reasons why we practice baptism by immersion or plunging or submersion is because that's what the word baptize means. The second reason we practice baptism by immersion is because that's the consistent pattern of baptism that you see in the New Testament. The consistent pattern of baptism in the New Testament is immersion. In other words, when you look at the examples of baptism all throughout the, the New Testament, what you see are people being immersed into water. So just jot down Mark chapter 1, verse 10. You see Jesus, he came up out of the water, which means he was first immersed out of the water, then he was lifted up out of it. You see it with the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 39, and a bunch of other places. Third reason we baptize by immersion is because baptism by immersion best displays the meaning of baptism. It best displays the meaning of baptism. In other words, if baptism is the picture of how God saves his people by bringing them safely through the waters of judgment, then ba baptism by immersion best symbolizes that picture, that meaning. Or if baptism is a picture as well of our union with Christ and his death, his burial, and his resurrection, then baptism by immersion best symbolizes that meaning rather than sprinkling or rather than pouring. And this is really important, like, God takes his symbols really seriously. Like their symbol, he institutes those symbols for a reason because those symbols communicate something about the meaning of what those symbols are symbolizing. And so if you begin to mess around and tweak and adjust the symbols, then begin to mess around and tweak and adjust the meaning of those symbols as well. And that's, that's not a good thing. And so then that's why we baptize people and how we baptize people by, by immersion. Believers baptism by immersion. So put all that together, right? The why. Why we baptize people. See that within the storyline of Scripture. Who is to be baptized? See, that's really a question of who is the new covenant, new covenant community and how are you to be baptized? Believers baptism by immersion. And so then, nice lesson on baptism. So what do we do with it? Like, What's the practical takeaways for different people that are represented here in this room? Three takeaways for three different groups of people in this room this morning. Not on your handout here, and then we'll be done. First is this. If you're here this morning, you're not a Christian. You're, you're, you're not a Christian. Then here's my exhortation and my, my appeal to you. If you're here this morning, and you're not a follower of Jesus. It would be this. Trust in Jesus today and be baptized. Like if you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, like hear this. Right now, the waters of God's judgment are hovering over you, ready to be unleashed. Unleashed. 
because of your sin and your rebellion against the Lord. Those same waters of God's judgment that flooded the earth in Noah's day, the same waters of judgment that consumed and drowned and devoured the Egyptian army in the Exodus, the same waters of God's judgment that were poured out on Jesus on the cross, those same waters of judgment are hovering over you. And if you died right now, then they'd be unleashed and you would drown in the flood of God's judgment against you. The good news, though, is that God made a way for you to safely pass through those waters of judgment that you deserve for your sin. And that way that He's provided for you is is Jesus. That if you trust and believe that Jesus lived the perfect life you could not live, He died the substitutionary death that you deserve, He was plunged in the waters of God's judgment for you and safely passed through them in the resurrection, then if you trust and believe that that's your one and only hope for being rescued and saved from the waters of God's judgment that you deserve for your sin, then He will save and rescue and you will safely pass through the waters of God's judgment as well. Not because you're so cool and good and religious, but because you're united with Jesus and He safely passed through them as well. And so then if you don't know Jesus in this way this morning, my appeal to you would be trust in Jesus by faith here this morning. And then come talk to me or come talk to Jared about what it means to be baptized. Second takeaway then is for those who are Christians here this morning, and have never been baptized as a believer by immersion, like I've described here this morning. Like if that's you this morning, then I think you know what the exhortation is. Be baptized. Be baptized. Like after the service, come talk to me, come talk to Jared about what next steps, like what what, what will it look like for you to be baptized in this church? But be baptized. And then third and finally, if you're here this morning, you are a Christian and you already have been baptized as a believer by immersion, then what's the takeaway for you? The takeaway is this. Let all that we've seen this morning elevate your view of baptism and the importance of baptism. It's not just a hoop to jump through. Let it elevate your view of baptism and the importance of baptism. Secondly, let it cause you to just rejoice. (laughs) Let it cause you to worship. Let, let Let it... cause you to reflect on how God by His grace has safely rescued you through the waters just like He rescued Noah and Israel and just like He rescued Jesus. And let all this then compel you to go out and share the gospel with others so that they can be rescued and so that they can safely pass through the waters of God's judgment as well. And as you share the gospel with them as some may come to believe and trust in Christ Uh, then urge them, urge them to be baptized and to visually symbolize and portray what's happened to them by being dunked into the water and being raised again, demonstrating their union with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection as he was plunged into the waters of God's judgment, conquered and was raised, safely passing through those judgment waters for our sake. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Lord, we pray. Um, Just thank you for your symbols in Scripture that you just don't make them up on the fly. Um, Just They don't just pop out of nowhere because just some random shove people into water and raise them back up. The Lord, help our understanding of baptism be informed by just the entire story of the Bible and the continual pattern and theme that we see, that this is how you rescue people. You bring them safely through the waters of judgment. And thank you for how you've done that in Christ for us, that he is our representative, and that through faith now we are united with him. And we get the opportunity and the privilege to visualize that through water baptism, believers' baptism by immersion. Pray that if there's anybody here this morning that needs to be baptized or anybody here this morning that doesn't know you and 
in Jesus and placing their faith in him like we've talked about. Pray that you would use your word and the things that were said um, in their hearts. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen.